Hello, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Gregory Bowler, Jr., the founder and managing partner for KMT Partners, a company specializing in sourcing and executing unique industrial development opportunities in primary and emerging markets along the East Coast. How are you doing today, Greg? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you doing, Tony? Not too bad. Not too bad. Trying to stay out of this Philly heat right now. That's that's. Yeah. The <laughs> well, at least, at least you don't have the Georgia humidity. Um, it's going to be like 97 to have today. So. Yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so please, yeah, tell me about your um background and what led you to specialize in the industrial sector of commercial real estate. Oh, that's a, a mouthful. Um, but the. You know, originally from Philadelphia, uh, born and raised there. Um, I went to Florida a and University uh, and majored in mechanical engineering. Um, you know, also play played football, walked on there and, and earned a scholarship. And uh, that's how I paid for school. Um, and uh, by my senior year, I was open to other opportunities where I could leverage my mechanical engineering degree. Um, but also leverage my, uh, you know, more extroverted personality, uh, leadership skills, et cetera. And so uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, which is called JLL uh, NAM, uh, is one of the larger global commercial real estate services companies. Um, their product and development services group was doing a recruiting, um, um, you know, a trip or whatnot to several different HBCUs. They went to BAMU, they went to Tuskegee, they also went to Howard, specifically looking for diverse uh, students that had a uh, technical background, so architecture, engineering, and construction management. Uh, so they don't typically recruit, um, and uh, they definitely don't recruit at HBCUs. And so um, the timing of it was really just kind of uh, perfect um, and, and well aligned and let's move into new opportunities. When I spoke with the recruiter, he explained to me that engineers are great from a standpoint of becoming project managers as well as architects um, because of the problem solving skill set that you get um, and really kind of looking at solving problems on a linear basis um, and so kind of getting through all the minutia and really kind of focusing on the critical path issues um, to, to solve the problem. And so it was like, hey, like we're project managers, we manage the architects, we manage the engineers, we manage the GCs for owners. Um, and so, you know, for me, uh, it sounded like a promotion day one, going from being an engineer to managing engineers. So again, just kind of open to the opportunity, but they ended up recruiting 12 students to Chicago. Uh, it was about a three-day interview with several different regional directors um, within this project management service group. And uh, they ended up selecting four students. And I was one of the four. Uh, the gentleman that was running the Southeast, uh, that region at the, at the time, uh, he took a liking to me. And uh, another one of my peers that also went to FAMU. Uh, and so both of us ended up coming uh, down to Atlanta um, kind of worked out perfectly. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, is from Atlanta. She was already there uh, getting her master's. So again, just uh, everything just kind of falling, falling in line there. So that's how I got into commercial real estate. And um, now, how did I get into industrial? That was specifically during my time period uh, at JLL. And I was there for around five years. I uh, started out doing student housing. Um, project management, and and that was a great uh, experience. Then ended up moving over to the retail side, which was more um, uh, like Family Dollars, Chick Fil A's, Dollar Generals, uh, a ton of renovations, expansions uh, across the country. Uh, traveled a, a ton, met a lot of people. Great experience, but I wanted to get back to the more ground up, uh, singular, more complex and larger development projects. And so um, industrial had an opportunity uh, for me to make the move on over. And this is all within the project and development services group of JLL, right? So just a great 
basis and, and training ground, um, you know, to becoming a developer, at least from the technical aspect. Uh, and so I joined the industrial group the latter half of my time at uh, JLL, and I really fell in love with the property type. Um, even though it looks extremely simple from the outside, it's extremely complex um, from the civil aspect, you know, to, to, to take this heavy topography or if it's environmental issue, issues that you have to remediate and then, you know, get all of that approved. And then also you have a very large floor plate that has to be flat. Um, and so that requires a significant amount of civil engineering and they really lead the design aspect versus like an architect and, and other property types. And so I don't bring in an architect until probably I start construction. Like I, I just don't need um, an architect on board because the building itself is pretty simple. Um, and most GCs can price um, the building there, but it, it is also complex inside the building when you talk about these users that are very broad. I mean, you know, not just Am everybody knows Amazon. Target, right, but you know, when you think about manufacturing aspect, you know, even today, you're seeing a boom of you know, kind of assemblage, uh, uh, EV batteries and and automobiles, etc. Right, all of these things are inside of warehouses, um, and even on the logistics side, talk about FedEx or UPSs or other third party logistics companies. I mean, the material handling equipment is just in. To talk about AI. I mean, they've been doing that well before it became popular because a lot of it is um, autonomous uh, and, and robotics. And so um, I, I enjoyed that aspect as well. So it's a good balance um, of, you know, making sure that we're executing for a business and less around individual people, even though it does affect people from a workforce development standpoint. Um, it's, you know, the, the decision making is purely around, is this the best thing for my business supply chain needs? So, uh, there you go. Interesting. And speaking of making the, I guess the best decision for the business, what's your investment strategy? Yeah. So the, the way, you know, what I focus on a lot of my, uh, investment strategy is about 80% speculative industrial development. Uh, so when I left Transwest, I mean, I left JLL and I joined Transwestern Development, which is a private national um, development arm. That's really where I learned how to create generational wealth in commercial real estate. Uh, and so that model actually goes back to Trimble Pro, um, who was you know, really kind of like the godfather of, of that model. And so it's, sourcing land opportunities, getting the land entitled, getting it rezoned, getting the site plan approved, right? Everything that you need to be able to do to start site work construction. And, you know, but before you do that, you're also, you know, sourcing the equity, sourcing the debt uh, for the deal. You're managing the GCs and the design aspect. You'll manage the construction without knowing who the exact user is going to be. Um, you would hire a leasing broker as well, you know, so I mean, the JLLs, the Cushmans, the Colliers, et cetera, they would lease that space. Um, and once it's leased, we sell it. Or if we have a user or investor that says, hey, we um, feel comfortable and just you know, acquiring the building vacant, then we'll, we'll sell it as well, too. So that's what we call emergent development, meaning, you know, we're opportunistic. We're, you know, only looking to essentially come in, add significant value to land that, you know, might just be raw land, to redevelopment, et cetera. But um, maybe it's not in its highest and best use at that time period. Um, and once that risk has been mitigated, then, you know, we're in and out uh, to where we can get, you know, kind of long term cap gains in, in that aspect. Gotcha. Is there a particular size property that you are looking for? So de deal size, I would say, is no smaller than around 15 million, um, you know, kind of total deal size. And then uh, right now I have a deal that's around 100 million. Um, historically, I've really kind of stayed in that kind of 20 million to 
the, the largest I've done is around 150 million. Um, and so that I kind of stay in that sweet spot um, to where me as the GP, and I might bring in partners as well as the GP, but we're the five to 10% of the equity. And then we'll bring in a partner that's the 90 to 95% of the equity, which is some advisor of institutional capital. Uh, and then I have debt. The total deal cost, which is about 55 to 60%. Average. What institutional capital, ha in your experience, has been most receptive to industrial um, investments? Yeah, pensions. You know, so pension funds are um, very active in investing in a multitude of different investments, right? They have a portfolio that they invest in, but they, on the real estate side, if you look at that allocation, you know, a lot of it goes towards industrial today, mainly because it's been a very resilient uh, property type. You know, you're talking about way of the structure from the lease standpoint is triple net leases. So the OPEX aspect of it really flows straight to the user. Um, and so there's not much CapEx that's required there. You're also seeing significant rent growth, uh, mainly because industrial needs to be close to the population. Really, I mean, that's ultimately what it's serving, either from an e-commerce aspect or even on the manufacturing and even on the data centers. Like the data centers need to be close to the population. Uh, and so, you know, there's entitlement issues with that, right? Because there's not a lot of large scale industrial land that's near about a population. So, you know, that supply constraint does allow for uh, more rent growth overall. Um, and then we, you know, we feel really good on, we're pretty behind on, uh, e-commerce, um, when you compare it to China or you, yeah, which, I mean, China's the, if you look at the percentage of e-commerce to overall retail, it's about 50% to where we're half that, um, you know, so we, we, you know, still have a long growth there. And then I love what we've been able to do from a, domestic manufacturing aspect, which is also um, help drive demand for uh, industrial warehouses. Uh, and so, yeah, a, you know, a lot of it has been allocated towards industrial, but then, you know, you have multifamily as well, which multifamily is still trying to figure out where the bottom is there. Unfortunately, from a lease structure standpoint, right, you're talking about individuals that are leasing this and a lot of the newer multifamily has been constructed or underwritten in a way that assumes that um, these individuals can pay for these rents uh, that probably have been proven or, or not. Uh, but today, what we're seeing is that they can't afford it. So it's an affordability issue there. And then also all of the, from a uh, OPEX aspect, that actually flows more towards the landlord. So it starts to erode the NOI uh, for, for multifamily. And so cap rates have also expanded. They're not exactly sure where those are going to land at as well. Um, and then they're getting really hit hard on insurance and taxes um, as office is suffering from a leasing standpoint. And so they can't afford to pay the taxes that normally most municipalities would assess with them. So that has to flow over to multifamily and, and multifamily is having trouble there as well, right? So, you know, it, it just is a safer bet if you're investing in real estate from a commercial standpoint to actually invest in industrial. And are there some particular markets that are on your radar? I know you're not um, just in, you know, Atlanta, you're mm -hmm. in some other markets as well. Uh, which ones and why? Yeah. So no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in Atlanta. I've been here for, you know, almost 14 years and, uh, you know, so I want to make sure I'm doing deals in the backyard. Uh, that's just a slight bias there, but you know, Atlanta's great. I mean, it, it is historically a, you know, supply chain, uh, and logistics city. Uh, the original name for Atlanta is terminus, you know, because of the rims. Um, and so you think about how many, interstates actually um, come together at this city. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You can't say that for most cities. Um, and then you see a good amount of population growth and you see that all across the Sun Belt, but Atlanta is seeing a huge boom in that as well. 
Um, and then you also have you know, also because of Atlanta and the, and the logistics aspect, a lot of that driver comes from Savannah. And so the port of Savannah has continued to invest in in, in that port and its improvement and expansion. And it's, it's continued to grow uh, significantly. I was just looking at, they were doing the report for their May, you know, kind of container growth. And I mean, it grew like 23% from last year. Um, right now, you know, Savannah is like the third and fourth um, busiest in the, in the country, right? So LA Long Beach is two ports, but they're all to, they're together. Um, and then you also have, you know, the Newark port as well. And those have typically been like the top, you know, one to three. Um, but Savannah has continued to grow and take on significant market share there, especially with the Panama Canal. Um, so it's like, hey, we're going to avoid LA and Long Beach, or we're going to go, you know, south, go through the Panama Canal. Since we can handle the large ships now, like LA, Long Beach, and Newburgh, then they're able to come to the Savannah Port. And a lot of those containers go on uh, I 16, which ultimately takes you to 75, which takes you to Atlanta. Um, they could go on 95, which would say it goes to Florida or it goes to the Northeast, but the majority of it, like 70% of it, goes on 116. Um, to where the only thing you can go to is is Atlanta. Um, so that's also another driver uh, as well. And so that's that's Atlanta and then Pennsylvania, where I'm also from. So I've also a slight bias there as well. Um, but I've done a ton of development in Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia. So kind of Lehigh Valley area, Central PA, which is you know, Harrisburg. And then up to Scranton area as well, which is Northeast PA. And that's also a huge logistical hub. And the big driver for that is, I mean, you can essentially get to around 40% of the country in one day's drive. So that's round trip, um, you know, for truck drivers. Also, it's a cool option uh, for a lot of these users versus being in New Jersey uh, or New York. Uh, and they can get more scale. And so New Jersey, New York, a lot of that is union labor. So you have more affordable labor in Pennsylvania as well. Um, and then you can just kind of look at interstates, you know, between 83 and 81 and, you know, 76. And uh, the turnpike, you know, it takes, takes you all the way through. Um, Interstate-wise and regional connectivity is, is massive. Um, you know, so you can quickly get to DC, Baltimore, Philly, you know, New Jersey, New York, right? Um, I mean, that's where your dense population uh, is. Um, so those are like my two big focuses. PA does kind of flow over to New Jersey, Southern New Jersey as well. Um, DC, I love as well. Um, again, the kind of prior experience being developing in the DC area. And so uh, continue to look for different opportunities around D.C. You have high um, incomes uh, for that, and there's heavy barriers to entry, uh, and a lot of the product, the industrial product that is there is, is obsolete, but these users have to be there. Uh, so you can provide a new product for them. They are more than comfortable paying the increase in rent uh, to, to be in that space, knowing that they're going to have a lot of functionality. Um, other markets I, I like and I will expand to at some point, but right now I'm just kind of leaning me in, uh, is Nashville, uh, Charleston, and definitely Savannah. Um, and so, yeah. Um, earlier on, you mentioned Amazon. You mentioned um, industrial properties being used for uh, EV manufacturing. Are there any other, I guess, trends or uh, indicators in the market that kind of show where things are going with industrial um, investments? Is it going to stay e-commerce and EV manufacturing, or are there other things that are kind of emerging at this point? Well, you on the on the the manufacturing, the domestic manufacturing. I mean, the the kind of two major investments have been either on the EV side or on the chip manufacturing side. Uh -huh. As, Certain certain states the more demand dependent upon where it's at, and so chip manufacturing has actually been extremely heavy in like Texas and the Midwest. 
um, to where EVs have been extremely heavy in Georgia. Um, and so Georgia is the only state that actually provides the full life cycle for you know electric vehicles. And that's all the way down to getting the raw material coming through the port and then being able to assemble all of that and manufacture all of that in the state of Georgia, including the batteries themselves. And then also breaking that down and decommissioning it all the way down to the raw materials and shipping it back out. Um, and so that that's rare in the sense of, you know, I mean, compared to any other uh, state in the country. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I kind of hit on the note of the e-commerce aspect. I mean, as we, you know, we are digital consumers today. Um, and the pandemic really showed the baby boomers that um, I probably should have Amazon product. Um, or I probably should, you know, start ordering things online and just have it delivered, you know, to the house. Cold storage is another driver as well. Um, when you talk about the grocery aspects and delivering of that, um, you know, it's a shortage of cold storage. Uh, data centers, um, there's a heavy shortage there and the demand is, 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 is wild. Um, you know, and so you're seeing AWS, Amazon, you know, web services, Certainly going longer is there, uh, Microsoft as well, uh, Google. I mean, they, they are that data accumulation. You know, everybody thinks it's up in a cloud, but it's it's in an industrial building <laughs> nearby you, um, right? And it's so, not in the sky somewhere? It's not in the sky. It is real estate. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that is extremely important as well. And then when you add the additional demand of AI, and what that means as far as data storage, it, that is it, that demand driver is extremely huge. So it's a lot of capital going after that. It's also capital intensive to do data centers. Like I can't do a data center on a spec basis. I can't just you know build it and not know who the end user is. I have to essentially, I might find a land, I might get it entitled and get it rezoned for industrial, which will allow for data center usage. But I can't go and spend the money to build that building without knowing, you know, who that end user might be. And so, you know, but you market it to those that are looking for that land uh, opportunity and you'll get an opportunity to either you know, flip the land or, or do a build to suit uh, in that aspect. And so there's multiple, you know, kind of different drivers. But again, all of this is kind of under the industrial subsector and I haven't even got into iOS, which is industrial outdoor storage, um, which you know entails like truck terminals and uh, just truck trailer and, and container storage, just empty storage for that uh, maintenance for the trucks uh, and the containers, et cetera. Right? I mean, that's a whole business in itself, um, and they're all around the country. A lot of them are mom and pop um, companies, and so you're seeing a lot of institutional capital saying, hey, I'm going to aggregate this property type, again, because of the barriers of entry. Um, a lot of times the zoning is extremely hard to get. Typically you need like a heavier zoning for um, that use because there's a ton of outdoor storage. Sure. Um, and so, and you really want to be, uh, you know, near and have a proximity to other iOS uses as well. So actually my first um, development, you know, in my, in my company, is an iOS development now it's on a larger scale because the most iOS is anywhere from two acres to around six acres and it's it's gravel you know it may have a shop on it as well or, or not but most likely it does and so what we're doing is providing a more class a quality of iOS and so you know it's this raw land right now we're going to create it we're going to pave it so it's asphalt you know, we're fencing it from a security standpoint, you light it, make sure that you have, you know, kind of proper lighting there as well from a safety standpoint. And then we're also building a 20,000 square foot pre-engineered metal building on there. And so the majority of that is going to have maintenance bays, but then you have an office component as well. Uh, so we'll start construction in, you know, the next you know, three to four months and uh, deliver Q3 of next year. And we're already seeing huge, huge interest there. Our, this is about 13 rental acres. Um, so a little, again, a little larger than uh, a typical iOS. Sounds super exciting. 
So Greg, I guess in wrapping up, for those who are interested in what you're doing, want to learn more about your projects and your company, how can they reach out to you? Uh, you can go to my website, uh, which is kmtpartners.com. Um, you know, I'm also on LinkedIn as well, Gregory Bolton Jr. Um, so, you know, reach on out and, uh, you know, look forward to catching up. All right. Sounds good. Greg, so much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. And best of luck with all your projects. I appreciate you, Tony. Take care.